Welcome to this video on the second creation story in Genesis. This story starts in chapter 2, verse 4, halfway through the verse, with the words, In the day that the Lord God made the earth. But a couple points uh, about the previous story in chapter 1. There's at least one scholar who has this interesting idea that in verse 26, when God said, Let us make humankind in our image, that does not refer to a divine um, court, but it's a grammatical way of saying the royal we, like uh, a king or queen might say, let us do that. Now we're going into the second story, and we'll see how it starts, but it starts in some way similar to the first story. Um, verse 1, in the beginning when God created the heavens and the earth. You can take that, as I said, as a dependent clause, and then you can read verses 1 through 3 as a whole. Um, and that's very similar to uh, chapter 2 and also another creation story in, in the Middle East that probably influenced these Hebrew writers. The idea is that you say when God created, then there's sort of two parenthetical clauses, then the final uh, statement, God said, let there be light, and there was light. Uh, so you can see that pattern. In the first story, it says, in the beginning, when God created the heavens and the earth, the earth was a formless void, tohu vabohu, and darkness covered the face of the deep, while a wind from God swept over the face of the water. So the situation here is not that there's absolutely nothing, but that there are these primordial waters and God's spirit is over them. And what God really says to start things is let there be light and there is light. And similarly in this story, it starts out in the day the Lord God made the earth and the heavens when no plant of the field was there for God had not caused it to rain, but there was a stream there so those are the two conditions. Then the Lord God formed man from the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. So it's the same situation. Dependent clause, uh, a couple uh, parenthetical situational descriptions, and then the action. And in this story, God creates man first. God creates the first human being and then the animals are created. So this really is a different uh, creation story. It's a more of a Yahwist uh, story because the name for God is Yahweh. And it comes from probably a different tradition, a different document. And these two creation stories were put together by an editor. This second creation story uses a different name for God, Yahweh. Previously, we had the word Elohim, the, the name of God. Here we have Yahweh, but in English it's translated Lord, and, sometime, and in this story, uh, Elohim and Yahweh are together, so it's translated Lord God. But I think Lord is a terrible translation. Uh, the text says, Yahweh, uh, w without the vowels, but it says Yahweh. It does not say Lord. Lord is a concept of a political totalitarian monarch, a ruler. Yahweh is a proper name. So we should look at this as Yahweh. And the story starts with the creation of um, Adam from the ground. And the word ground is Adama. So Adam is created from Adama. So there's a play on words. But it's more than just a play on words because it's a statement of the mortality of human beings. They come from earth. So Adam is as literally something like earthling. And he is from the earth, but he also has the breath of God in him. So the breath um, and obviously this is not a scientific theory. This is a theory about the value of a human life. And each human being has that breath of the divine. The breath is the inmost um, expression uh, of life. 
Uh, so it's an intimate connection between Yahweh and humanity. And the second creation story continues. And Yahweh Elohim planted a garden in Eden in the east. Eden is a very old word, scholars tell us. It goes way back to the Sumerian. So this gives us evidence that the biblical writers had access to these very ancient creation stories and were adapting them. God plants various plants for Adam to eat and also the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. This idea of the knowledge of good and evil really means experience. To experience something is to have knowledge of it. And it means also romantic or passionate knowledge of someone. So a man would know his wife, for example. So the idea here is that God does not want Adam to eat of this particular tree. And this this uh, tree of the knowledge of good and evil, this appears to be a very unique idea. Uh, it's only in the Hebrew Bible. So the writers here are, are being creative and not just using previous sources. So the story continues. Yahweh Elohim took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to till it and keep it. And the Lord God, Yahweh Elohim, commanded the man, You may freely eat of every tree in the garden, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat, for in the day that you eat of it you shall die. So there's uh, a couple things here about morality and ethics. One is God sets laws, and there are certain laws that differentiate right and wrong. And secondly, what's so bad about this tree of the knowledge of good and evil? Uh, some people interpret this as God doesn't want Adam to have knowledge. That is, is not a, a reading. You have to know in the Hebrew that the idea of the knowledge of good and evil means this sort of passionate pleasure kind of knowledge where you have experience. And that's the second aspect, that this is what takes human beings away is when they want to experience this pleasurableness of passion, um, of anything. And this is sort of a danger point. So this is what this great myth is, is telling us. Not that you're not supposed to get knowledge. That has nothing to do with this. It's that you, when you experience something just for the experience of it, say pleasure or drugs, or whatever, that on that day you will die. Now, we later find out that Adam and Eve don't technically die, but in a way they do because they are cast out of the garden. They can no longer eat of the tree of life, which apparently they could, and they die inside. They become mortal. Something inside them dies. So that's the uh, one way uh, of in interpreting this passage. Next, in verse 18, we have Yahweh Elohim say, It is not good that the man should be alone. I will make him a helper as his partner. So this is a um, another mythical way of looking at the, the reason uh, human beings form relationships. Um, this is sort of a study in loneliness and companionship. And here we have Yahweh in this passage. He's acting very differently than Elohim. Elohim was very uh, abstract and up in the sky. This Yahweh is very much involved, walking in the garden, molding things with his hands, uh, talking with, with Adam, and creating creatures for Adam. And again, the order is different here. In this creation story, Adam is created first, and then animals are created as potential uh, companions. In the previous story, uh, which comes from a priestly source that uses the word Elohim, uh, animals are created first, and then human beings are created as sort of the culmination or the ultimate creation. Yahweh is a God who is 
almost like a human being, like a, a superhuman being who molds things with his hands, talks specifically to um, people, and he will even talk to the snake. Whereas Elohim just said things, and that's a very abstract kind of saying. He really wasn't talking to anyone when he said, let there be light. It was just more like a thought. So this conception of Yahweh is different. And we tend to read this as mythological, as poetic, um, as not very literal. But uh, at least one well-known biblical scholar said, perhaps we should look at this a, a little bit more literally, that this was the conception of Yahweh, at least here in chapter 2, of a more physical God, a God like a great human being. Uh, more of a, a God who actually literally walks and talks and forms things. And the story here ends with verse 24, 25. Therefore a man leaves his father and his mother and clings to his wife, and they become one flesh. And the man and his wife were both naked, and they were not ashamed. So this is a state of uh, alleged primordial innocence. Uh, where there's, there's no shame associated with nakedness. And of course, that will be different as we go into chapter 3.